Welcome to this podcast from Concordia Theological Seminary. I'm Dr. Charles Gieschen, and today we are presenting on the Epistle Lesson for Pentecost 15, Series B, that is Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 to 20. This is a very familiar text to uh, pastors, uh, one that uh, uh, we often allude to in our preaching or in our teaching, namely where Paul teaches about putting on the full armor of God. Uh, one of the things that uh, I would encourage you to, one of the resources I would encourage you to look at is this great commentary by Tom Winger in the Concordia series. Uh, it has a lot of wonderful resources and these epistle lessons, including this one uh, from Ephesians chapter 6. Uh, and I'll certainly um, draw on that uh, a little bit as we uh, go through the text uh, together. Uh, before we move to the Greek text, I do want to say uh, in, in, in introduction is that this text is a wonderful text encouraging our sanctification, encouraging us to live in our baptismal grace. So this language of putting on the armor of God really is reflecting the, the uh, life that we have because we have been baptized into Christ. Uh, it's not something that we uh, in a sense, do in and of ourselves, but the armor of God really is an image for the kind of uh, uh, what life that we are given in baptism. Uh, and I'll as emphasize that. It's a point certainly that Winger makes in his commentary and one that I think that uh, uh, would be good to emphasize in your preaching. Second point I'd like to make is simply this, that Isaiah 59 is absolutely foundational for Paul's teaching here. He's not making up this stuff just by looking at uh, Roman soldiers and saying, well, you know, in, in light of what I'm seeing, I'm just going to use that as an illustration for, for the Christian life. You know, they have armor, you have armor. But rather, he's drawing on imagery that's present already in the Old Testament. And if you look at Isaiah 59, you have this emphasis of, of the Lord um, coming in uh, deliverance and redemption. Uh, and I'd like to just read that section. It begins already in, um, in verse uh, 15b of chapter 15, 59. And you see there these uh, words, the Lord saw it and it displeased him. There was no justice. He saw that there was no man and wondered that there was no one to intercede. Then his own arm brought salvation. His righteousness upheld him. He put on righteousness as a blessed breastplate and a helmet of salvation on his head. He put on garments of vengeance for clothing and wrapped himself in zeal as a cloak. According to their deeds, so he will repay uh, wrath to his adversaries, repayment to his enemies, to the coastlands he will render repayment. So they shall fear the name of the Lord from the west and his glory from the rising of the sun. And he will come like a rushing stream, which the wind of the, river of the Lord drives. And a redeemer will come to Zion to those in Jacob who turn from transgression, declares the Lord. So here you have a section where this image of of um, the armor of God is actually used for God coming in deliverance for what happened in Jesus Christ. He came with righteousness he, uh, as a breastplate with a helmet of salvation on his head. He had the garments of vengeance for clothing. He's the one that has won this battle in which we fight. Uh, one might say better uh, image, he has won the war in, in which uh, we fight various battles. The war has been won by Jesus, who is that great warrior. And so, in a similar way, Paul says, just as the, the Messiah, the, the one who came as Jesus, had these things and brought deliverance, now these are the things given us in our baptism. And we are to put these on as we carry out spiritual warfare in a war that has already been won by Christ. And your preaching emphasized that point. We're in battles, but we're in a, a battles in a war that has already been won in Christ. We don't have any question about that outcome. Let's now move to the Greek text here, uh, starting with uh, chapter 6, verse 10. Uh, and here you have this interesting, uh, to the remaining... Uh, the the lopoi here probably better translated 
uh, finally. It's kind of the remaining thing as in, I want to just cap off my discussion in this epistle with this image. And in the, the uh, present, <clears throat> presenting of the text here, I tried to contrast, uh, first of all, as, as you know, if you watch any of my podcasts, I put the verbs in uh, green, I put the participles in purple, but in this layout here, I wanted to contrast the language that's used for the armor of God. You see that already in verse 11. And so whenever God's armor is mentioned, the different pieces of the armor, I put those in the, the, the red. And then that's a contrast to, as you see here, the devil's schemes, the schemes of the Diabolu. And I put those in light blue. So you see the contrast, how Paul speaks about Satan and his work and what we contend against in terms of darkness and principalities, powers, all of this. That's in the light blue, and you see the contrast with Paul speaking about the armor of God. Why is it so important in terms of the armor of God? Because he first brings out the kind of warfare we're against in terms of Satan. And so then by highlighting that, you see then the significance of the different things that he emphasizes in the armor of God, all of which are laid out. Uh, most of which are actually mentioned in Isaiah 59 that we just went over. So, uh, this is a summary in terms of, this is kind of the climactic uh, end of his epistle, his encouragement in terms of our life, our baptismal life, our life of sanctification, and this language of being strengthened in the Lord, uh, here, uh, sometimes translated um, actively, I'm translating it passively here. Why? Because uh, the emphasis is in the Lord. Uh, this is baptismal language. To be in, in the Lord, in Christ, is always baptismal language. So we are to be strengthened in the Lord uh, is not something how we, you know, pump iron and then we are ready for spiritual warfare. Rather, we live in that baptismal power and grace that we already have because we have been baptized into him who has won the spiritual war against Satan through his decisive action in his life, death, and resurrection. And then you have, you have the, uh, a, a, a Kai that is really explaining what does it mean to be strengthened in the Lord, namely in the power of his might. Uh, so you have this language in his mighty strength, um, uh, in, in, his, in the strength of his might. Uh, here the, um, the emphasis is just reinforcing that the Lord is not another angel like Satan, but he is none other than the Almighty God. We confess that in the Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty as creator. He is above all other spiritual beings in, that have been created, including all the fallen angels, including Satan. And so the emphasis of God as Almighty, the Lord Jesus as Almighty, comes across very powerfully. It's a, it's a verse that, that is to encourage confidence. Then you have, again, that same verb used here, namely to... Um, to, uh, or to, to put on the, um, the uh, to be clothed with the full armor of God, right here. The armor of God is the theme that uh, comes through the rest of the verse that's introduced right here in verse uh, 12. Um, in order that you may, so what is the purpose here? You have an articular infinitive. You see the Greek infinitive with the, art, with the article and the preposition, uh, it's to express purpose. We're used to hinna clauses a, li a lot in Greek to express purpose. This is simply another way to do it. You use the preposition plus the article plus the infinitive in order to be able to stand. An important theme in this verse is this language, the histemi language of standing. 
in order to stand against the, um, the, the uh, schemes of the devil right here, the schemes of the devil. So that's contrasted. Why do we need the armor of God? Because we are in a spiritual warfare. We are uh, going against the schemes of the devil. And this emphasis of being able to stand, uh, battle, if you're knocked down, usually you're out. Um, the emphasis here is being able to withstand these. So we need the defensive and offensive weapons God gives us in order to stand against Satan's attacks. You see this verb, the histemi verb, uh, not only here in verse 11, but we're going to see it again in verse 13. We see it right here with the compound. You see it again here, the same infinitive form, the end of verse 13. And then you see it right at the beginning of verse 14. So the emphasis of standing fast, of standing in battle, not being knocked over. And how can we do that? By the defensive and offensive weaponry God gives us for this battle and for this warfare. It's in a war that he has won. It's in you know, using the kind of uh, defensive and offensive weaponry he himself used to win the war for us, uh, the breastplate of righteousness, etc. Going on to verse 12, uh, you have uh, because, uh, or yeah, uh, you have the, the haughty right here uh, explaining why is this important that we, wear, we have the, the, the um, armor of God because our struggle, namely right here, this, uh, our struggle, it is, there's a verb for here, for this se sentence. It's uh, not against just blood and flesh. So it's not just against human beings. We see those people around us. We have challenges there, but there's even bigger challenges that we face as Christians namely the invisible spiritual realm of fallen um, angels and including the fallen angel Satan. So our struggle is not just against uh, blood and flesh, but, there's the adversative, uh, Allah, but against the rulers right here, and here is the emphasis of Paul on the spiritual realm of Satan. Satan was the ruler of this world due to sin. Christ has overcome his rulership, his dominion, and yet Satan still is present uh, until the final day where, Sa where Satan is thrown into the lake of fire, a la Revelation chapter 20. So this language of against the rulers is just speaking about fallen spiritual beings such as Satan and other fallen angels. Against the authorities, that's another term that sometimes is used by Paul in terms of speaking about fallen angels, um, the, the, the rulers, the authorities. And here, another term, uh, against the, the, the cosmo, here, cosmocrates, the world powers, that's the um, it's again speaking of, again, of darkness. We just saw this in the epistle lesson for Pentecost 13, the contrast between darkness and light. So the world powers or rulers, uh, the world powers of darkness, of this darkness, namely of the fallen world, uh, of the sinful creation. Uh, so he heaps up a couple of terms to describe uh, the fallen uh, angels, uh, including Satan. And he then also summarizes it in the next phrase where he says, against the spiritual forces of evil. Again, pone rios there is uh, uh, the emphasis of uh, all of those fallen spiritual beings that rebelled against God. That's what our, our battle is against. Uh, and it's these are, are people that are in the spiritual realm, here in the heavenly places. Namely, uh, you have not only visible manifestations of the fallen um, creation, but you also have invisible spiritual beings. And so Paul is reminding us of that in verse 12, listing all of this really as a summary for what we would call Satan and his fallen angels. 
Then verse 13, on account of this, namely, because of all these things, that's why this armor of God is important. And so here the emphasis of the verb is to take up on a lambano here, the imperative form. So this is what we are to do is to take up that which we are given in baptism, and that we are to put it on. And again, you have that language of armor. We just saw it earlier. There it is again uh, here in verse 13. It's the armor of God. It's in contrast to Satan, the devil. Here we are given the armor that belongs to God. We see it in Jesus Christ. We share that same armor spoken of in, in Isaiah 59. In order that, again, the emphasis here, in order that you are able to stand. You have the verb dunamai, and whenever you have that verb, you need uh, its object. Here it's stated, the object is stated by um, uh, the, uh, the infinitive form of histemi in order that you may be able to withstand the evil day. Uh, here, again, a, a term used for the kind of challenges we face between the time of Christ's first coming and his second coming, uh, especially until that final day when Christ returns and sin and Satan are forever um, taken away. And so, <clears throat> and then you have this, this uh, inclusive term, having accomplished all things, the, the, uh, you see the, uh, the participle has that root uh, erga, having worked all things to be able to stand. So having gone through all of the vocational things of life, you're still standing at that last day. You're still um, uh, fighting the spiritual battle. You're still um, clothed with Christ's righteousness, his forgiveness, his life. And then the emphasis again, um, stand therefore, the, uh, the verb again that we've talked about, and then he gets into the actual um, uh, individual pieces of the Christian armor here. Uh, having been um, belted right here, having been around, uh, been wrapped around your waist, belted uh, with uh, right here around your waist with the truth. So here's the first piece of armor is the, uh, the belted with truth. Uh, we keep in mind that that's a, a strong image even for Christ himself who is the way, the truth, and the life. We also keep in mind your word is truth. So, you know, being belted with the, the, the truth that's found in God's word and especially with none other than Jesus Christ as the truth. The second thing that's listed here is what goes on uh, your, and being uh, clothed with the breastplate here. Again, that imagery of uh, in the participle being clothed with the breastplate of righteousness right out of Isaiah 59. So again, all of these sort of are defensive weapons. That which is around your vulnerable stomach is the truth. That which you hold in front of yourself to protect against swords and spears is a breastplate, and it's the righteousness. It's a strong term used, obviously, for Christ. His righteousness is what clothes us and protects us. Uh, his perfect righteousness is what enables us to stand before God on the last day. So a beautiful, rich term in Paul's theology, Romans uh, and Galatians especially, you have that term used. Verse 15, you have then all the way down to the feet, uh, having been shod with your feet uh, here, right here, uh, with what? The gospel of peace. And, it, you know, the, uh, the feet of those who bring the good news, it's an image from Isaiah. So this imagery of the gospel of peace, the gospel of uh, the, the message that, uh, that we bring is of God having reconciled us, brought irene, peace between God and man through the death of Jesus Christ. So that gospel is, um, is part of our daily life that we live out. It's, uh, in a sense, what we carry wherever we go in our daily vocation. 
uh, is that gospel of what has been, happened through the reconciliation of Christ. And then you have verse 16, where uh, you have Paul writing, among all of these things, uh, right here, among all of these things, then he uh, also emphasizes taking up the shield of faith. So here again, uh, breastplate is, um, is a protective item, and certainly shield is an additional protective item to, even before people try to strike our breastplate, to have that shield stand uh, between, um, between our breastplate and our attacker. And here, the emphasis of faith. Keep in mind how closely these two are related, righteousness and faith. We are righteous through, through, by faith alone. Paul in Galatians and, and uh, Romans emphasizes that point. And so this emphasis of faith, and certainly we bring it out in our Lutheran church by emphasizing, as Luther did, faith alone. And so the shield is the shield of faith. Then you have uh, at the end of verse 16, uh, these words, uh, with which you are able, namely, in which uh, you are able, all of the, um, all of the uh, flaming arrows, you see here the emphasis of flaming arrows of the evil one, which is a reference to Satan. So the arrows of the evil one, which are flaming, uh, here we should have that in purple. It's actually participle. And then you have to extinguish. So uh, remember sometimes in attacks, they not only sent arrows, but burning arrows. Why? Because that would cause destruction with homes and all of that. And Satan certainly attacks. So this imagery of the danger of not only an arrow coming in, but flaming arrows. And yet, the uh, breastplate of righteousness is our defensive weapon, breastplate of faith here. Excuse me, the shield of faith is our, our defensive weapon against Satan's types of attacks. Uh, and again, verse 17 then continues, finally, the helmet uh, of salvation here. So this, this is the, um, one of the last defensive weapons the, uh, the, what covered the head. You strike the head, you kill somebody. So having the helmet of salvation, salvation again, the image of what Christ has accomplished for us already is our protective weapon against Satan's attacks. We've been saved um, by his grace alone. It's given as a gift. This is baptismal imagery. This is what you're given at baptism. It's merely living out what you have in your baptism. Uh, and uh, so that is what you... Um, what you receive right here is your verb uh, from decomai to receive. And then <clears throat> the offensive weapon that's brought out at the end of this is the, uh, the, the uh, sword. Sometimes it's uh, understood as being a little shorter of a sword, almost, uh, but the sword of the spirit. Uh, so not only do you have these defensive weapons that we have in baptism, but we're also given the Holy Spirit, specifically through his word. He works as an offensive weapon to engage not only in defending ourselves, but in attacking Satan. What did Jesus use in the temptations that Satan threw against him? He used the word of God. He quoted the scriptures. And certainly that is brought out by Paul in saying, which is the rhema theu, which is the word of God. Uh, then finally, he concludes this uh, section with uh, emphasizing then um, the, um, what I would say, we'll roll this up a little bit first. In these final verses, namely verse 18, you have uh, him explaining with every prayer and petition. So here, uh, basically the kind of worship that he's talked about earlier in his epistle, 
uh, he returns to here. So with every prayer and petition, as we carry out this spiritual uh, battle, uh, we are engaged in praying and, and calling on the Lord um, to be praying. Here's your participle. In all times in the Spirit. So, the sword of the Spirit is to be used, but it's to be used also by, with prayer. Um, and here again is just the, the Christian life. The Christian life certainly is involved prayer, but it also uh, involves um, defensive weapons, it involves offensive weapons, but all of this is lived out with uh, prayer and petition. That's what he's emphasizing here. Uh, and it's uh, in the Spirit, obviously. Uh, the Holy Spirit is being referenced here. And uh, then giving full attention to this, right here you have the participle, uh, and then you have this emphasis in this last part of verse um, 19, or excuse me, 18, uh, giving full attention to this with all persistence and petitioning concerning all of the saints. So we are to not only pray for our own spiritual battle and life, but really pray for the whole church. Pray for all of the um, ta Ton hagion is the communion really of saints. It's the, the holy ones is a reference here to the church. Praying for our fellow Christians. Praying for the church throughout the world. Uh, as we carry out our own daily Christian battle uh, in, in the, the uh, spiritual warfare that goes on. And then verse 19. Not only for all the saints, but also for Paul. Namely for pastors, for the apostolic ministers. Uh, here Paul calls on them to pray for him. Why? So that in order that, here's your purpose clause with the, um, the hina plus the subjunctive mood verb. You have an order that it may be uh, given, right here from, from uh, ditto me, uh, uh, the, a word to open the, my mouth. So the emphasis is Paul wants his mouth to be opened and the word of God to be proclaimed. Why? You see it in the next phrase. In order to, right here, make known what? The mystery of the gospel. He's talked earlier about the gospel. Uh, right up here, the gospel of peace. Here he's emphasizing the mystery of the gospel. And whenever he brings up mysterion, he's talking about the person of Christ. Christ is really the content of the mystery of the gospel. It's not Gnostic knowledge. It's the revelation of Jesus, uh, who is the mystery hidden in the Old Testament, revealed in the New Testament. Then verse 20, finally, for which I am acting, huper, on behalf of, uh, uh, that's a, a benefactor language preposition, on behalf of whom I am acting uh, as an ambassador uh, in chains. So you have this emphasis of him being one who is uh, acting as a spokesman in chains. Here, obviously, Paul is speaking about the fact of his uh, imprisonment. Namely, he is one who is dealing with this uh, in, um, in, his, uh, in his own imprisonment. Hina, in order that I may be emboldened, here's again further uh, purpose, in order that um, uh, in it, namely in this message that he's speaking, he may be emboldened uh, as it is necessary for him to speak. So this last section is really asking them to pray for the furtherance of this mission that Paul has started, namely to get the, the mystery of the, the gospel, the message of Christ out to the world. So uh, as you preach this text, we'll go back to uh, just concluding. As you preach this text on, on Sunday mornings, it's a, a wonderful text to encourage Christians to live out their baptismal life and to use this imagery Paul has given for the various protective 
um, uh, elements for spiritual warfare that Christ has given us in our baptism, as well as the offensive weapon, namely the sword of the Spirit, the Word of God, literally the gospel of Jesus Christ, uh, and, and to live that out in our daily vocation, always with the understanding that as we engage in spiritual battles, we're in part of a war that has already been won by Christ. Christ who wore these things, who had the perfect righteousness, who had the perfect trust in God, who faced Satan's temptations and, and won, who paid for all of our sins. So we carry out this spiritual battle, not wondering if the war is going to be won, but in the confidence that it has been won in Christ. The Lord bless your proclamation of this text in the week ahead.